feels so nice to be with you. Chidori! Thank you, Junpei. I love you. This can't be happening. Chidori? Chidori, answer me! Chidori! With Junpei, Chidori shared an incredibly special bond. A bond that taught her not only how to care, but how to live as well. So when he was shot, Chidori immediately knew what she had to do, and decided that rather than continuing to run away from this bond that changed her life for the better, she'd embrace it for everything that it is, and use her power to its absolute fullest to heal Junpei's wounds, saving his life in exchange for her own. And despite finally being forced to come face to face with the death that she now so greatly fears, she does the deed with no hesitation, as she knows deep down that even when she's long gone, a part of her will always be with Junpei, both literally through the life energy that she used to heal him, and figuratively in the form of the unbreakable bond that they'll always share. And that's the tale of Chidori. And her story has always been one that's kind of stood out to me, not necessarily for being any better written than other character arcs, but just simply due to the fact that it provides such a unique, alternative perspective to one of Persona 3's already so prevalent themes. To live is to forge bonds. The sentiment that's explored all throughout the game via its main character party members, as well as its many social links. But what happens when you take one of Persona 3's antagonist characters and explore this concept through them? In a game whose villains all operate under an ideology that completely disregards the value of living in the first place? Well, you get Chidori. A character who experiences extreme turmoil as a result of this seemingly incompatible mixing of ideals, but who ultimately comes out on top in spite of that, simply due to the sheer power that like-minded human connections can provide. The interesting thing about Persona 3's antagonists is that, despite their obviously antithetical views, I wouldn't go as far as to say that they're completely misguided. In fact, they're certainly onto something in the way that they characterize life as an impossible, never-ending struggle in the face of death, because, well, that's just kinda true. But where these villains very clearly miss the mark is in their shared nihilistic sentiment that the only real way of counteracting this paradox is by simply choosing not to partake in the struggle to begin with. A despondent resignation of life in light of the death that's just going to happen anyway. But alternatively, our protagonists, rather than serving as complete and total ideological foils to these villains, also acknowledge the existence of that same never-ending struggle, but instead actively and eagerly choose to participate in it in spite of that. And that might sound totally contradictory, but really, most people operate in this way. Not because of some grandiose good guy philosophy, but simply because it just makes them happy. Sure, it may not all be sunshines and rainbows, there's certainly incredibly painful and traumatic things in store for just about all of us, but at the end of it all, those happy days, those unforgettable moments that we share with the people that we love more than anything, without question make every single bit of it worth it. It's a lifelong Sisyphean battle, but the bonds that we make and forge along the way are exactly what make that struggle something that we can be content with. Sisyphean. If you happen to not know the origin or meaning of that term, it's defined as denoting or relating to a task that can never be completed regardless of effort. And it comes from the old Greek tale of Sisyphus, the story of a king who, in his attempts to cheat death, was banished by the gods to a place known as Tartarus, where he was then forced to spend the rest of eternity pushing a boulder up a hill, only for it to, once almost at the top, come crashing back down on him every single time. A divine punishment orchestrated by the gods in an attempt to teach Sisyphus about the nature of his mortality. And most would imagine this to be a living nightmare, a punishment far worse than death ever could be. But in 1942, a French philosopher and writer by the name of Albert Camus challenged this commonly met conclusion by attempting to re-examine the story of Sisyphus in a more optimistic light. To quote his essay on the matter, The Myth of Sisyphus, There is no sun without shadow, and it is essential to know the night. The absurd man says yes, and his efforts will henceforth be unceasing. For the rest, he knows himself to be the master of his days. One always finds one's burden again. But Sisyphus teaches the higher fidelity that negates the gods and raises rocks. He too concludes that all is well. This universe, henceforth without a master, seems to him neither sterile nor futile. 
Each atom of that stone, each mineral flake of that night-filled mountain, in itself forms a world. The struggle itself toward the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. In this essay, Camus makes the case that although life is nothing but a constant, never-ending struggle in the face of the absurd, taking charge and truly becoming the master of one's own world is enough for anyone to achieve their resolution. Even for someone as eternally damned and hopeless as Sisyphus, a character who serves as the perfect embodiment of this absurdist philosophy. In the story of Persona 3, our main characters and protagonists are constantly engaged in the never-ending push of the boulders that represent their lives, while the antagonists have never even bothered to try with theirs. And Chidori would have certainly never touched hers if it wasn't for the friend and lover she found in Junpei, forcing her to stand up and push her boulder whether she wanted to or not. And although she briefly gave in due to the overwhelming struggle, Chidori kept on pushing and achieved her resolution through the display of power that saved Junpei's life. And despite having to sacrifice her own to bring back his, she dies with a smile on her face, knowing that she righteously seized her one and only opportunity to live and to love before she was gone. One must imagine Chidori happy. The parallels between Camus' myth of Sisyphus and Persona 3 certainly don't stop at just Chidori. In fact, one other character that I feel more than deserves to also be analyzed from this Sisyphean angle is Aegis. Aegis is a very interesting case because, unlike every other character in this game, she can't die, at least not in the conventional sense. Being an android, as long as there are still people around to repair her, she can be rebuilt and rejuvenated again and again holding the incredibly unique position of being the only character in this game who will almost certainly outlive everyone else. As you know, Aegis is a machine that was created for the sole purpose of eliminating shadows, but in order for her to be able to wield the persona power necessary for fighting said shadows, she was built with a personality, and by extension, the inherent ability to learn and to grow. And over the course of the game, you get to watch her gradually evolve from a cold and calculated machine into a thinking, feeling individual that mirrors a normal human in just about every way. All because of the many bonds that she forms with the rest of the main cast. And by the time January rolls around, an optional social link for Igus becomes available, through which we're given a lot of insight into what it's like living as a robot in a human's world. Throughout this link, Igus struggles and comes to terms with all sorts of things, like her identity, what it means to be human, what it means to live and to die, etc. But to me, the single most interesting thing regarding this link, and by extension her character as a whole, would have to be the internal conflict that she experiences regarding her pre-programmed sole purpose, to protect humanity. As an anti-shadow weapon, protecting humans is quite literally the sole reason that Igus was created, and it's a life's mission that she's more than glad to pledge her existence to. But when the bonds of friendship changed her into a human-like being capable of perceiving the joys of life, and by extension the abstract horror of death, Igus began to operate not out of the cold and calculated obligation of her code, but rather out of a genuine, motivated desire to protect the lives of those that now mattered to her. However, in an ironic twist, this newfound humanity surrounding her life's mission of protecting people made it all the more clear to Igus that, in an existential sense, she can never truly achieve that goal if every human is eventually going to die and leave her behind no matter what she does. Nevertheless, throughout her arc, she gradually comes to make peace with this fact, accepting the death that will befall those around her, but not at all hesitating to continue protecting them in spite of that. And that is Igus's parallel to Sisyphus a life's mission to keep others safe that she knows full well will never come to a conclusive end, with that very endlessness being exactly why she will never stop fighting. And without a doubt, this aspect of her character is most brilliantly portrayed through the game's final scene, where, spoiler alert for those who might not have finished the game, the main character is on the verge of death, and Igus remains right there by his side, holding him until the very end. And when I first finished this game, the way I understood this scene was that, deep down, I guess actually knew that Makoto was dying and had already been preparing for it. And even though the answer, the epilogue chapter that was added in the FES release of the game, suggests otherwise, this is still my personal favorite way of looking at it. That I guess could tell that something was not right and that she was slowly losing Makoto, but that after having grown so much and come so far during all her time spent with him, she was, even in the face of such a horrible tragedy, able to exhibit ultimate strength of the spirit and achieve her resolution. Even during a scene as heartbreaking as this, 
one must imagine Igis happy.